This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Popular YouTuber and Kickstarter fraudbuster Thunderfoot recently posted a video about how he's getting sued for 15 seconds of video after receiving a demand for a license payment. In his video, Thunderfoot explains that he received a $750 demand for his use of video of the failed Starship SN9 landing in his video, SpaceX Busted, Part 2. A lot of you messaged me about this dispute. Thunderfoot even asked for my opinion in his video and on Twitter. The big burning question on everyone's minds seems to be, is this an example of a legitimate fair use? So I thought this would be a great opportunity to go over the details of fair use through a basic legal analysis. Before we get started, I should make a few disclaimers. First, I am a licensed attorney who practices copyright law every day. But this is not legal advice. While I'm attempting to answer the question of whether this use is a fair use, I am not providing individualized legal advice. I am not representing either party, and each party should consult with their own attorney to receive actual legal advice on how they should proceed. Second, I can already tell that this issue is particularly important to many of you, and that makes it a great topic for discussion. But I want to caution that we need to keep an open and unbiased mind in order to properly evaluate the situation. We want to come to our conclusion after the analysis, instead of looking for evidence that supports an already formed conclusion. This helps us reduce or eliminate personal biases. So, let's take a step back, shake the cobwebs out of our corona-fatigued minds, and begin. Copyright claims require ownership of a valid copyright and copying of constituent elements of the work that are original. Copyright protects only the parts of a work that are attributable to the creative input of the author. Factual works are considered differently than creative works. A plaintiff must demonstrate that 1. the defendant has actually copied the plaintiff's work, and 2. the copying is illegal because a substantial similarity exists between the defendant's work and the protectable elements of plaintiff's work. This will be important later when considering what about claimant's work is protected. Fair use will involve a balancing of the four fair use factors from 17 U.S.C. section 107. Copyright claims and copyright damages will depend on copyright registration, so let's include that. Copyright damages will involve issues like actual versus statutory damages, as well as attorney's fee shifting. Claims for attorney's fees will involve an evaluation under the Supreme Court's Fogarty v. Fantasy standard. We saw this in the Akila Hughes v. Carl Benjamin case when the court called Hughes' copyright claims objectively unreasonable, one of the Fogarty factors. While there's no DMCA takedown in Thunderfoot's case yet, copyright claims on YouTube could involve the DMCA. The DMCA claims involve the standards from Lentz v. Universal for considering fair use and the misrepresentation standard in 17 U.S.C. section 512F. Next, we can check some things off of our list that won't be big issues in Thunderfoot's dispute. We can assume that Mallman owns the work he says he does. In other words, we have no reason to believe that he doesn't own the original footage. And we know that Thunderfoot used Mallman's video in his SpaceX busted video. He admits that he did so in his I'm getting sued video. So we don't have to evaluate whether actual copying happened. We know that it did. Instead, we'll be focusing on whether the copying was protected under fair use or not. We can also quickly determine the nature of Malman's original work, whether it was factual or creative. A purely factual work would be the example of the phone book white pages. A purely creative work would be a work of complete fiction, like the Lord of the Rings books. Here, Mallman's video is a mixture of factual and creative. The event he's filming is factual, a SpaceX launch and landing. But the filming of the event is creative. Courts have regularly ruled that camera work requires creative choices like lens, framing, camera settings, and camera angle. The setting and lighting are also creative choices, but I don't think those apply here. 
With that out of the way, we are almost ready to begin our fair use analysis, but we still have to make clear what material is protectable by copyright. Remember, it isn't copyright infringement to copy only the unprotectable elements of the original work. It wasn't infringement for CBS to copy the concept of a tardigrade in space, because Anas Abdeen did not create tardigrades, nor did CBS copy his particular expression of a tardigrade in space. So what is protectable in Malman's work? he would not have protection for the SpaceX launch and landing against all other videos and photos of the launch and landing. Protection would extend instead to the video he shot. Someone else who recorded the same video but independently would also have copyright protection for their own video. Only if someone copied Malman's video itself could that be copyright infringement. Okay. We're finally far enough along that I think we can get to the fair use analysis. There are some other things on our list of issues, but those can be dealt with later, after we think about fair use. Fair use is a four-factor balancing test. The four factors are evaluated separately, and then weighed to see which way the balance tips. Not all fair use factors have the same weight. The first and fourth factors, transformation and market usurpation, are weighed more heavily by courts than the others, with the third factor, the amount used, then being weighed more heavily than the second factor, the nature of the works. Sometimes it's really clear which side is going to win. Other times the sides balance out and we have to keep going to find something, the distinction that makes the difference. And there's a chance we might decide that the evidence we have simply isn't enough to make a clear call. We could call this situation a tie, and either look for tie-breaking evidence, or acknowledge that the issue would need to be presented to a judge in a bench trial, or a jury in a jury trial, for a formal adjudication. Many times when lawyers find a tie situation approaching, the parties mediate or negotiate to reach a settlement of the matter to avoid litigation of an unclear issue. But if a court really hit a tie situation, then it might be forced to rule that the claiming party didn't meet its burden of proof, and therefore the defendant is not liable. Most judges facing this situation will signal that the parties should work it out or face an unflattering decision from the judge. Also, fair use is an affirmative defense, meaning a defendant accused of copyright infringement bears the burden of showing that its use of a work was fair. We don't really have complete record evidence of the party's arguments, so we'll have to work from Thunderfoot's and Malman's arguments in the video and Twitter threads, respectively. The first fair use factor is the heart of the fair use inquiry. It examines the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. The focus of this factor is whether the use merely supersedes the objects of the original creation, or instead adds something new with a further purpose or different character, altering the first with new expression, meaning, or message. It asks, in other words, whether and to what extent the new work is transformative. A transformative use is one that communicates something new and different from the original or expands its utility, thus serving copyright's overall objective of contributing to public knowledge. The critical inquiry is whether the new work uses the copyrighted material itself for a purpose or imbues it with a character different from that for which it was created. Courts have held that it is not a fair use to use an image solely to present the content of that image in a commercial capacity, or to otherwise use it for the precise reason it was created. For example, it is not a fair use to republish a photograph of a celebrity or public figure intended to generically accompany an article about that person, or to describe the event depicted in the photograph. Such uses merely supersede the objects of the original creation. However, use of a copyrighted photograph may be appropriate where the copyrighted work is itself the subject of the story, transforming the function of the work into the new context. For instance, a news report about a video that has gone viral on the internet might fairly display a screenshot or clip from that video to illustrate what all the fuss is about. 
Similarly, a depiction of a controversial photograph may fairly accompany a work of commentary or criticism about the artistic merit or appropriateness of the photograph. Courts have also found fair use in cases in which a website published a screenshot of an article from another publication that contained a copyrighted photograph alongside criticism of the article. It is, therefore, critically important that the commentary, criticism, or other transformation be made about the original copyrighted work itself and not simply use the work to illustrate a point about the subject of the original work. The purpose of both works here are commercial. Malman is a videographer who shoots for Ars Technica. Thunderfoot makes videos for YouTube and Patreon revenue. The character of Malman's work is to accurately capture the events of the SpaceX Starship SN9 launch in a way that appeals to interested viewers. Thunderfoot's video was made to debunk claims that SpaceX brings launch costs down by as much as 10 times. The video addresses claims allegedly made by Elon Musk and others that SpaceX will make space travel not just less costly, but also less costly by an order of magnitude. Since billions of dollars are at stake, Thunderfoot addresses the importance of making accurate claims so as not to mislead investors and the general public. Applying this standard to Thunderfoot's use of Malman's video, it is clear to me that Thunderfoot wasn't commenting on Malman's videography itself, the protected elements of Malman's work. When the footage appeared, Thunderfoot was comparing the successful landing of a McDonnell Douglas DCX program usable rocket from 1996 to SpaceX's Starship SN9 crash on February 2nd, 2021. Thunderfoot was commenting on the events of the SN9 crash to seemingly make the point that SpaceX is doing nothing new, that it's simply exploring ways to reduce costs in the same way McDonnell Douglas was back in 1996, and no one should be terribly excited about it. Thunderfoot was commenting and criticizing the SpaceX launch and crash, the unprotected elements of Malman's video. Thunderfoot didn't need Malman's video to make the point. He could have used any SN9 video or no video at all. The criticism element of fair use exists because our philosophy of law believes that authors wouldn't license works to critics, and critics are valuable in a free society, as critics often point out things that need to be improved or bust myths and lies, untruths that need to be corrected. But Malman's video itself was not the subject of the criticism or commentary. It was simply used to illustrate commentary or criticism that Thunderfoot was making about SpaceX. Malman is not an employee of SpaceX. The video is not the property of SpaceX. The video applies only because the subject of the video was SpaceX. Thunderfoot was not commenting or criticizing the protected elements of Malman's work, the choice of filming location, equipment, camera angle, framing, color work, or exposure. Thus, Thunderfoot's use of Malman's video involves the use of the video solely to present the content of the video. That is, to use Malman's video to illustrate a point Thunderfoot was making about SpaceX, not to criticize, comment on, or otherwise transform Malman's video, imbuing it with with new purpose, new meaning, or new character. Thunderfoot does comment on whether the people in the audio of Malman's background should be so excited. If a court agrees that this is criticism of Malman's work, it could tip the scale somewhat more towards Thunderfoot's favor on the first factor. But again, Thunderfoot was commenting on the unprotected elements of Malman's work, criticizing the people heard in the background, and not on Malman's work itself. Unless the excited person in the background is Malman himself, I still think this doesn't move the needle much. My conclusion is that the first fair use factor weighs in favor of Malman. The second fair use factor involves an evaluation of the work's creative content. This factor acknowledges that some works are closer to the core of intended copyright protection than others, with the consequence that fair use is more difficult to establish when the former works, more creative works, are copied. In assessing this factor, courts consider whether a work is creative versus factual, with copyright protections applying more broadly to creative works. 
Here, Mauman's video contains both informational and creative elements. It was taken to document the event of a SpaceX launch and landing. But Mauman also had to make choices involving technical skill and aesthetic judgment. Event videos are further from the core of copyright protection than creative or fictional works would be. This renders the degree of creativity a relatively neutral consideration. In my opinion, it's quite difficult to say how a court would rule on this factor in Thunderfoot's case. Malman's video is quite factual, and his creative input, while skillful, is less protected than the example of setting up and filming a scene for a movie. No matter what we decide, this factor weighs close to the middle. If we say that Malman wins this factor because of his camera work, it's still going to be of little weight. Likewise, if we say that Thunderfoot wins because he's using the factual part of the work, it's still of little weight to the final analysis. Thus, for my final judgment, I'm going to say that a court would give this factor little to no weight, which is consistent with similar court opinions acknowledging that this factor has rarely played a significant role in the determination of a fair use dispute. The third factor involves the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. This factor compares the portion of the use with the copyrighted work as a whole, with the goal of determining if it is reasonable in relation to the purpose of the copying. The court considers not only the quantity of the materials taken, but also their quality and importance to the original work. The crux of the inquiry is whether no more was taken than necessary. Thunderfoot used approximately 18 seconds of Malman's approximately 7-minute video of the SpaceX Starship SN9 launch and landing. 18 seconds of a 419-second video is about 4.3%. But Thunderfoot did use the portion of the video that could be said to be of more quality or import than the rest of the video. Malman makes this point in his Twitter thread saying that Thunderfoot used the heart of Malman's work. My only concern with this argument is that the heart of the work is normally the catchy part of a song or the climax of the plot of a whodunit movie. So I partially disagree that SN9's crash landing, something that Malman had no creative control over, really would be seen as the heart of Malman's work. Still, courts usually look at whether no more was taken than necessary, and the 18 seconds Thunderfoot used were really not that necessary. He could have spoken about the crash through his voiceover, he could have found or licensed other footage instead of using Malman's, he could have used a still frame from the video and still made the point. So it's hard for me to say that no more was taken than necessary to make the transformative criticism or commentary purpose. Again, Thunderfoot did comment on the excited people in the background audio of Malman's video. He could argue that's why he needed to use the amount he did, to show the crash and comment on the excited people who shouldn't be excited. Mauman might argue that Thunderfoot could have used just the audio, or just that portion of the video if that's what he was commenting on. With the amount used being relatively small, but depicting one of the more valuable moments of the event, and with the commentary being only about how excited the viewers were during the crash, it's quite hard to say that the entire 18 seconds was necessary for Thunderfoot's purpose. I do believe that this factor weighs close to the middle for purposes of balancing the factors, but I also think that this factor slightly favors Malman. The fourth fair use factor evaluates the effect of the use on the market for or the value of the original work. When a secondary use competes in the rights holder's market as an effective substitute for the original, it impedes the purpose of copyright to incentivize new creative works by enabling their creators to profit from them. Courts here look not for theoretical or speculative harm, but for copying of sufficiently significant portions of the original as to make available a significantly competing substitute. The focus is on whether the use would deprive the rights holder of significant revenues because of the likelihood that potential purchasers may opt to acquire the copy in preference to the original. This factor is most clearly exemplified by actual piracy or bootlegging. Selling an illegal copy is a perfect substitute for the original and deprives the original author of a sale. Clearly, Thunderfoot is not selling a direct copy of Malman's video. 
But that's not the only kind of market substitution. Failing to pay a license fee where required is also a market substitution. When your purpose is not transformative, failing to license the portion used does deprive the original author of the value of the original work. Again, this factor doesn't clearly weigh in the extreme favor of one party, it's much closer to the center, but I still think that a court would find that the fourth factor weighs slightly in favor of Maumann. But this factor, especially in this case, depends highly on whether a judge would find for transformation in the first factor. The more transformative, the more criticism, commentary, or news reporting, the less likely that the secondary use steps on the market for the original. Thus, if a judge or jury did determine that Thunderfoot's use was transformative, I think this factor would go the other way. With the fair use factor analysis finished, we can then complete the weighing and see where we are. We said that the first factor favors Malman, the second factor is likely a tie, and the third and fourth factors slightly favor Malman. Thus, my analysis at this time, without more, is that Thunderfoot's use of Malman's video is not clearly a fair use. But here's where I start to do the lawyer thing and start equivocating. I said during the analysis that two of these factors only slightly favor Malman and that the first factor would require more transformation to favor Thunderfoot. The burden of proof would be on Thunderfoot to show how his use is a fair use. It's entirely possible that, if the matter were litigated, the parties would make further arguments and a judge or jury might find that Thunderfoot's video is transformative enough to find in favor of fair use. But I don't believe the case would ever get that far. The costs of taking such a case through litigation would be enormous, at least when compared to the amounts at issue at this time. The costs hurdle can be eased by recovering attorney's fees when you win, but that's not so clear either. In the applicable fee-shifting case, Fogarty v. Fantasy, Inc., the Supreme Court provided four non-exclusive factors for courts to consider when analyzing whether to award attorney's fees. One, frivolousness. Two, motivation. Three, objective unreasonableness in the factual and legal elements of the case. And four, the need in certain circumstances to advance considerations of compensation and deterrence. Malman v. Thunderfoot might not be a great case for either party to expect to recover their attorney's fees. Both Thunderfoot and Malman seem to have a sincere good faith belief that their case is good. Thunderfoot believes that he made a fair use of Malman's video. Malman believes that Thunderfoot did not. Neither party seems to be pursuing the dispute out of frivolity. Neither seems motivated by something other than vindicating their rights. Neither's position seems objectively unreasonable, at least not initially, though it could become so later. And neither seems to be in need of deterrence, though maybe compensation and deterrence is the strongest factor. My point is that this isn't a great case to take to court. The amounts are small, the outcome uncertain, and the fee shifting could quickly devolve into a huge bill for one or both parties. And sending a DMCA takedown doesn't necessarily clear much up either. The standard for pursuing a misrepresentation in sending a DMCA takedown or counter notice only allows recovery when the defendant did not have a subjective good faith belief in their fair use analysis. Then we have the problem of actual damages versus statutory damages. If Malman's work isn't timely registered with the Copyright Office, he won't be entitled to statutory damages, only actual damages, and no attorney's fees. This kind of use, if determined to be infringement, is likely going to be on the lower side of damage awards. Malman is a professional who has licensed his works in the past. He has three registered copyrights linked to his works on file with the Copyright Office. His license fee history will also help guide a court's analysis of a potential award for damages. But with Thunderfoot's use of only a small part of the video, I'm betting a judge wouldn't award more than a few hundred to maybe a few thousand dollars tops. So the fight would be long and complicated, the attorney's fees would be high, the outcome is unclear, and any victory would likely be Pyrrhic, inflicting such a devastating toll on the victor that it is tantamount to defeat. If it were me in this situation, I would probably reach out to Malman and see if we could find a resolution. Thunderfoot makes a big deal that footage shouldn't cost $750 for 15 seconds, and to a point, he's probably right. 
YouTubers have long used footage in ways that are fair uses and in ways that are not fair uses, without consequences in many cases. Thunderfoot is right that if every copyright owner suddenly enforced their rights 100% of the time, YouTube as we know it would cease to exist. But regardless, or irregardless, copyright owners get to determine their own enforcement models and their own licensing fees. Mallman's $750 license demand might be in part because Thunderfoot didn't reach an agreement before the use, e.g., I want to use 18 seconds of your video, can we reach an agreement for a license fee, please? But Mallman's demand letter says that he typically charges a minimum of $750 for any use of his video footage. I don't know how true this is or not, but it would come into a judge's analysis of damages. When I make use of copyrighted material, I always make sure that I have permission, or that the work is in the public domain, or I abide by the terms of a Creative Commons license, or that I'm firmly on the safe side of fair use. And I generally recommend that, in these borderline cases, demand letters be polite and offer to open a dialogue rather than make accusations and threats. Copyright and fair use are complicated, and there are no bright line rules that make it easy to tell what's legal and what's infringement. It's normal to be unclear about fair use. I talk to clients every day who don't realize how copyright law really works. So I hope you've learned something here. I believe that we should strive to learn something new every day and leave every day better than we found it. Now I want to hear what you think. If you were a judge evaluating whose case is more convincing, who do you think would win an infringement versus fair use claim here? If you think Thunderfoot's video makes a fair use of Mallman's, try to articulate what commentary or criticism Thunderfoot was making about Mallman's video. Remember that criticizing SpaceX isn't the same thing as criticizing Mallman's videography. And if you think Thunderfoot's video is not a fair use, can you tell us what you think the proper course of action should have been? Was Malman right to send the demand letter he did? Was Thunderfoot wrong to react with a full video on Malman's demand? Either way, please keep it polite and civil. Anyone who must resort to attacking people instead of attacking the legal issues discredits any good arguments they may have had. If you want to continue the discussion on my Discord community, I'll put a link to our law channel in the description. Until next time then, I hope I've been able to clarify the Malman Thunderfoot situation. Maybe you'll consider some of the misconceptions here <clears throat> busted. Thank you for watching. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education channel here on YouTube. You can also find us on Floatplane and on twitch.tv slash lawfulmasses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Our channel is community supported by your monthly financial contributions on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsus.com slash law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters in the month of February. Joe Tyson, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Hytoff, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Bescherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Brandon Abel, Torpedon, Sovereign Titison, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, RDH Dragon, Nathan McCarty, and Winter Grill. And thank you as well to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on your screen. I hope everyone has a great week. I will see you in the videos that drop. I love you all. Bye. I'm not a cat.